we have with us today. Christian Nova Korea from the NYU Latinx Alumni Network, San Libras Arctic. Sandy Medina from the Vecina Squadron. Patricia Diaz Rodriguez from the Hispanic National Bar Association. Alana Marat from Latinx and Sports. And Jacqueline Flores from the Latinx Theater Commons. And we're going to stick the bios, we're going to stick all the stuff. And we're going to let you all introduce yourselves. Um, we'll start with Kennedy and Christy, since we refer introductions, maybe you can talk and then uh, we'll end something as I would like to. Great. Okay. <laughs> hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Amelda Gorea. Uh, I also go by Christy. I'm the president of the NYU Latinx Alumni Network, and I'm also the board president of a brand new nonprofit called Libre Active. Uh, so nice to meet all of you. Uh, welcome to the space. And we're really excited for a really robust conversation about building community. And I'll turn it over to Kenny. Thank you, Joel. My day job is I'm the program planner and content strategy director for Cartoon Network, Humor, and the Digital Maps. Um, but I'm also one of the co leads for their employee resource group called Vibras. And I'm also one of the founders of Vecinos, which is a collective of over 60 corporate ERGs within the tri state area. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you all. I'm just going to get a little guidance. I didn't say this. Um, if you're coming into your Latinx organization, what was your inspiration behind your group and leadership position? You kind of talk a little bit about the that connection. Yeah, you did, but continue to do that. For me, um, I'll just start off right off the bat. Uh, when I was working, before I worked at Warner Brothers, I used to work at Paramount or Viacom. Um, I was the only Latino on my department, and I was the only person of color for almost 10 years on the team. During those 10 years, I started losing myself because you're simulating so much that you kind of lose who you are as a person, as a Latino. And it wasn't until I joined an employee resource group that I kind of started rediscovering who I was. You know, sometimes us first generations that enter the workplace, we don't know, we don't know the rules and regulations of the workplace. And sometimes we struggle to fit in and how to adapt. And for me, when I joined the employee resource group, it was the first time I really found my voice. And what I realized was that within if I was going through this struggle, I can only imagine other people of color in the workplace, how sometimes they feel left out or they have a hard time assimilating or fitting in. And sometimes because the workplace was not created with us in mind. So I made it my, my journey to kind of try to change that narrative. And one of the ways I did it was to start speaking up more within the company. You know, I wanted to address the issues that affected uh, Latino employees within the workplace. You know, one of the struggles that we have as Latinos is that a lot of us are managers and below, but how do we get to directors? How do we get to VP? What are the steps that we need to take in order to evolve? And without without the help and without really knowing the blueprint, you, you go on that journey to try to help elevate everyone. And I think I'll stop there and punch it over to someone else. You want to talk about about your background? Yeah, so um, I'm first generation in Boliqua. Uh, I like to say I'm a proud Jersey region, uh, grew up in Jersey City. And um, throughout grammar school and high school, I was very involved in clubs, a student leader. And my dad received a third, a third grade education. And my mom, she was a product of the 60s and 70s where the mother stays home, right? Even though she had the pursuits of becoming a nurse full time. And so um, they always instilled in us mm -hmm. value of education. Yeah. And when I went to NYU, it was very intimidating. I studied acting, and a number of my colleagues were already working in film and television, even though they were 18 years old. And here I was, bright eyed, with two tails, in musical theater, um, a big hand in my group. However, I didn't know where my place was. And so when I entered the workplace, I was in another environment where. Um, there were numerous people who didn't reflect the experience that I had, the rich culture, the vibrance of mi gente. 
And so over time, I realized there have to be spaces. And so with NYU, they invited us to a Six Flags family day. I ended up going there, having a great time with people. And um, they invited me to another event and they said, hey, we're starting these affinity groups for Latine. Do you want to apply? I said, I throw parties. I know how to have a good time. <laughs> And so, um, you know, there began the next chapter, right? And so I began looking for resources and other people like vecinos, like Latina Theater Commons to create community. And we'll get into that a little bit more to get straight from us. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, excited to be here with you all today. My name is Stephanie Flores. I'm the producer for the Latin Theater Commons. And the Latinx Theater Commons was created um, just over 10 years ago. It was Karen Sacarias, who was a playwright, brought together seven other theater makers um, in DC because it was at a time where they were noticing a lot of lack of representation of Latin folks in the theater field. And so they came together to have a conversation of how do we change this? And so they created the Latinx Theater Commons, which is uh, we use a common space approach. A consensus and we through sick making the consensus. We need to find that as not everybody necessarily saying yes to things, but everybody agreeing to move forward. And so we have a very flat leadership model. Um, and we produce programming around the country that centers Latinx voices and Latinx artists. So have been working on that for the past uh, 10 years. We have a national Assembly advisory committee board that helps us make decisions and move programming forward. It was all created to make an influence within the American theater, to make Latinx theater a part of the American theater so often overlooked and, and put in the second, um, like smaller stages. And so uh, that's what I think. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Patricia Villa Rodriguez. Um, my day job, I am a tech lawyer. I work as a senior director at Inquirer, which is a consulting firm here in New York. Um, I also am fully our diversity activity feature in practice at Inquirer, uh, where we go into companies and pretty much figure out what's going on with their culture. Um, I'm also the president of the National Hispanic Bar Association for the State of New York, which is a uh, national nonprofit org to help promote the betterment of our know, lawyers across the country. We are one of 19 regions, New York being one of them too. Um, there's a bunch of us around that offer scholarships and mentoring and also at preps and a bunch of other kind of things to help students along the way from middle school all the way through law school up to, you know, mid career levels. And it's nice to be right in. Oh, I got involved. With I think um, for me, I got involved as a president because I feel like a little bit like Kennedy did in the reverse, right? I'm a very light skin, I mean, I don't speak Spanish. So to speak. You know, like, well, you don't, you don't speak, I don't speak Spanish. It's just what it is. And a lot of New York, a lot of other Latinos don't speak Spanish. It's not a, a, a trace of not being enough. I'm still just as Latina as everybody else. And so when the position came open, you know, I think allowing people to feel like they can be whoever they want, right? You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to speak Spanish, you don't have to wear a suit and tie or wear to support. You know, you can really do who you are. You can make whatever career you want. You can make it your own. If you do, it's obviously a profession, right? Don't bust me, like, that's crazy. But I think for me, it was important because I hadn't seen or I felt very small in other organizations where I felt like, well, I kind of don't fit in. I have green eyes. I don't speak Spanish. You know, my story is a bit different. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to let people know that there are other stories to be told, and it's okay to feel different. You know, there's you know a lot of similarities. It's okay to feel a bit different. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name's Alana Meras, and I am the founder of Latinx and Sports. Um, aside from that, my day job, I work international partnership activation at Major League Baseball. Um, Latinx and Sports was founded in October of 2020. Um, following Hispanic Heritage Month and not seeing a lot of Hispanic Latinx representation amplification from a lot of teams and leagues and no one really talking about their front office. I am a huge believer, and if you can see them, you can be them. And that was something that was really what drove the 
creation of Latinx and sports. We are a soon to be nonprofit that puts together virtual networking calls, panels, as well as now in-person events. We've had some events in California, New York, Arizona, soon to be Texas, which is really exciting, but we're here to really connect directors, managers, coordinators to the next generation that wants to get involved in the sports industry. I think when I was starting out and I wanted to work in sports, I didn't really know that was a viable career until I really got to college. So starting these conversations sooner and amplifying the stories of those that are already involved in the industry that have a Latinx background is something that's very important to us and just continue showing the representation and amplifying it however we can. But yeah, it's a little bit about what we do. Thanks so much for everyone for introducing yourself. I think kind of what I keep hearing is there was something missing, right? Like you were in a job and there was something missing or an opportunity came and you felt something missing from your personal life. So you took that leap in. Um, Kennedy, I wonder if you can start us off with kind of how affinity groups can be a place to lean into whatever you might feel is missing, how that can be expansive, like what, what they look like, what they are. But you kind of talked about that, but really immediate. Yeah. yeah. So affinity groups are not a new thing. They've been around since the 60s. Um, it started off with uh, when a bunch of black uh, employees at Xerox started having issues at the company and all the black employees grouped together and basically raised complaints to uh, the executives and they were able to implement changes within the company to better help all the employees. And I think that over the years, it's branched out. Um, Infinity groups, for the most part, are just employee-led groups that work on behalf of the company to create well-being and a self, safe environment for, for all. Um, affinity groups are not just, are, can be, you can have an affinity group based on race, gender, age, ethnicity, all different types of gamuts. But the whole point of it is to create a well-being and a safe environment for employees within the corporate world. Where it's gotten a little, where it's changed a little bit over the years is that employee resource groups have started to provide value to the corporations, where we're not just all about the employees anymore. We're trying to make a difference. Us as Latinos, we're, our population is growing. It's going to be majority in a few years. And how do you market to them? How do you talk to them? How do you connect with them? Us as ER affinity groups or employee resource groups or business resource groups, we are now starting to provide that value. Why? Because we are Latinos. We know what we want and how to reach our, our own people. And now we've kind of started to create that more, that additional value. And I think that that's helped us have a bigger voice because we are now difference makers. Where before it was all, all about us kind of trying to make a difference in the environment. Now we're kind of out there in front, just being speakers and being representatives of our culture. <clears throat> I just no. want to add to that. Sorry. It's almost like thinking about having an internal focus group, right? Like you do a focus group like with cars or commercials and you say, oh, well, what's wrong with this car? And, you know, I'd love, you know, you're a mom. And so, you know, should we have this with, with ERG groups that are specifically led, whether it's veterans relations or, or, you know, anything, you have a group of people that are your target likely to whatever it is that you do. So to, to Kenny's point, it used to be something that was a, a function to help folks internally. Like, how are we going to get through this job because this job sucks? Now it's, well, how are we going to help the company, right? Because we have an opportunity for a business case. And the more that we provide value in a business use, the more likely they're going to give us resources and promote the things that we think are useful, um, whether that's legislation or, you know, activism, whatever, add and insert anything. But it went from something that was very grassroots communal to now you know, major, almost all companies, all Fortune 500 companies have ERGs and it's designed to be a business case um, versus, you know, like a pizza party, which it used to be. Yeah, I mean, the evolution is really beautiful, right? The evolution from like kind of this resistance to try to get more rights to being in a powerful position in companies and like the more you're in these in these groups, you're able to really make change, add value to yourself. That's what I'm hearing anyway, add value to yourself and the group. It's really evolved a lot, which is, sounds really beautiful. It has. I think that when we first started, what you realize when you join an affinity group is that you have access to the executives, something that normally in your day job you really don't have, because some of these executives are your sponsors. So for us, um, the CFO is my sponsor. He's a white man in his 50s, knows nothing about our culture, but now that you have that FaceTime with him, he starts to get invested in what you're trying to 
accomplish. And he starts to support it. And then if he's proud of the work, if he's invested, he also tells all these other executives all the great things that you're doing. So it gives you more visibility. It allows you to grow. It allows you to showcase other skill sets that you might not show in your day-to-day uh, your day -day jobs and responsibilities. Thank you. Chrissy, I wonder if you can elaborate on how that's going to be part of your mission, because I know as the president of the NYU Latinx Alumni Network, you've been, you've made it your mission to build bridges, to build bridges between all of these different networks within NYU, outside of NYU, and I wonder how you've watched that evolve um, and kind of why that's important to you and how these collaborations have impacted you and your communities. Yeah, this, this group has really been one that's been responsive to the needs of the alumni. Um, we have a core group of leadership. We call ourselves champions. Uh, we're board members. And so we sent out a survey to the alumni and we asked, what type of activities, what is it that you need? And when the pandemic happened and we went virtual, we ended up having engaging activities like uh, cooking classes or, you know, skill shares, just ways to bridge community. And in partnership with Vecinos, there was a conversation starting about mental health. So we're coming out of this thing. People are wanting to come back and be in person, um, but they're feeling a little uncomfortable or, you know, what are the best ways that we can talk about these things, especially in our culture that historically feels that mental health is stigmatized. So how can we have these conversations? So we said, let's create these community-led, community care, community-led uh, conversations. And that's really how Breathe, Explore, Restore was born. And we said, wow, professional development is really important to our group. Giving back to the community is really important to our group. And so we partnered um, for Three Kings Day with a local theater group called Teatro Sea, and we collected toys. And I said, let's take it a next, next step further. I'm gonna reach out to somebody I know at Univision. And we reached out to Un Nuevo Dia and we got coverage. And so that gave national exposure to a local nonprofit and these toys that we collected mm -hmm went to thousands of youngsters in the Lower East Side. So that impact wasn't just for our group. It reached many hands and many lives. And so- um, Can I add that that theater is the only children's theater, uh, Latino children's theater in America, not New York, America. So like really bringing this exposure is a game changer. I just wanna like point that out. It's important, like an important thing to prioritize and support. Yeah. And so these type of activities, you know, and in by creating these strategic partnerships with um, other affinity groups, especially, you know, I have to highlight Vecinos with their over 60 partners, we started in conversation and we said, what is it that the community needs? What is the responsiveness? And so we started with inside, you know, talking about mental health, maybe uh, talking about our, our histories, our identities. Um, and then this conversation about how we create community at work or in professional studies. And in August or October, we're going to be hosting our final series, which is um, Dress Your Best for Less, right? Being able to use thrift, stop, thrift shop items um, to really present yourselves authentically in the workplace. So we're really creating the full journey of the individual through these programs. And along the way, we're introducing other neighboring uh, groups, whether it's theater companies, law firms, um, sports groups, um, media entertainment. We're bridging all of those because the more resources that our community has, the faster that we're going to create visibility for ourselves and advance and get to that executive suite um, by having conversations and creating community, as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder on the culture and community, um, on in your bio, you speak of a love of culture being your inspiration behind Latinx and sports. And I wonder, and I, I noticed and I see, even in Kennedy, you said you were the only person in 10 years and how much pride that must have felt to like actually be with people in your community. And what you're doing, you're talking about the pride that you have. And I love that these spaces bring out so much pride in our culture. And so I wonder if you can talk about, um, yeah, how creating it has impacted your, your relationship to the culture, what your goals are for it, kind of how that's grown and expanded. Yeah, um, so I'm Mexican. That's where my family is from. I think a lot of times in these corporate settings, a lot of companies think Hispanic Heritage Month, Mexican, great, done. Like they don't think about Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Colombia, all these different cultures. And I think a lot of times it's very like overshadowing that like, oh, okay, 
whatever it has to do Mexican must apply to all Latinos. And in my job right now, my day job um, with MLB, I'm exposed to partners from like the DR, PR, um, Columbia, so many different places that I'm just like would have never been exposed to before. And it has really taught me not only about my culture, but the other cultures around me. I'm originally from Arizona. There's a very large Mexican population there. So that was very much what I was exposed to as a young child. But now through these affinity groups and learning, you know, with casinos and, and Christy and everybody else that I've been exposed to now, I've realized that there's so many other cultures outside of me. And I've been really able to appreciate that while also appreciating where I'm from. So that's something that I feel is very like powerful, powerful for us. Another thing that I've also noticed is Afro Latinos. A lot of times they're very much overlooked when it comes to Hispanic Heritage Month. And that is something that our group is very passionate about is, you know, making them feel included. A really big one for us is MJ Acosta. She constantly talks about how sometimes she's, you know, just put into one aisle when she's like two different cultures. And that's something that we very much recognize and we want to put forth and educate people and make sure that they feel a part of our group just as much as any other group that they're a part of. Um, so that's something that we're also very, very passionate about when it comes to culture. Absolutely. And it's one of those things, right, that's like we there's the power in numbers when we, when all these cultures are together, but it's also important to individuate and like realize that there's a lot of difference between all these spaces. And I think that even in my own experience of being Puerto Rican, it took a long time for me to really learn other cultures because I was like, oh, we're all we're all the same. You know, when I was a kid, we're all the same and we're not. And I think these spaces really give us a chance to individuate in the larger community, which is really beautiful. Yeah. And even then, I think we also all collectively feel a certain way. We're all we have the common the being prideful of where we are, even when it's different places, but we can all come together and be proud to be Latinos, Latinx, Hispanic, whatever, you know, term that you use. And I think that is also a beautiful part of our, our, of our different groups is that we're all from different countries and different cultural backgrounds and where we were raised, but yet we can all come together and identify under one to want to push forth all of our different missions, which is very important. Absolutely, absolutely. Because there's the common experience of feeling other, right? Of feeling like there's not representation. I think that transitions into theater really well because we're talking about the corporate space and mm -hmm. Latinos and history historically, like we don't get to, we're not encouraged to pursue careers in arts, right? So I wonder how you can talk about how even how you're seeing that evolve, your goals, um, and why is it why it's important to really show that that being Latinx people and Latinos can succeed in artistic spaces. Yeah, I think back to Alana's comment earlier of we can see if we can see them, we can be them. That's what I think about constantly in the theater. Like we get to see ourselves hopefully reflected on stage. And so often we see other people who may not look like us doing being lawyers, uh, working as CFOs, doing things that um we're oft we often are also doing or want to do, but the theater world has a um, a stereotype often when it comes to Latina folks. And so we see, we see it shift a little bit and the Latinx theater commons is trying to change this narrative. And last year we did a comedy carnival, which was a new play festival that focused on all Latina comedy plays because we wanted to showcase the joy that we all have. And we're funny. We're, we're not just like, you know, drug dealers and it's not just all about immigration and trauma and those are that's part of our culture and it's important to share but it's not all of our culture we're also really really funny people <laughs> um and so we did a new play festival and invited uh leaders and theater makers from around the country to try and get those stories produced more and two of them have actually gone on to receive world premieres at regional theaters which is really awesome so trying to to make change in that way and, and seeing it in different spaces, um, which is exciting. And then personally, I see more Latina folks working in theater spaces. And I think part of it is because you are now seeing more representation. You can have mentors. Um, I'm very grateful to have Latina mentors in my life that I don't think they had whenever they were coming up in the field. And so I think that is also really important, having that mentorship um, to guide you. Yeah, and it, it's like, that's the next step. The first step really is seeing it, like you're saying, and right. you know, we don't grow up seeing ourselves in arts, then we don't think we can be in arts. Right, right. And so it really is expanding our, our whole collective to say, hey, we can succeed in an artistic space and we can represent ourselves everywhere. So it's really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, Patricia, 
Uh, how has your role as the New York Region President of the National Hispanic Hispanic National Bar Association expanded the possibilities for your fulfillment within your career? I found that really moving how you talked about your background and you found purpose in this mission. Can you talk a little bit about how you found it and how you how it opened your possibilities for happiness in your career? That's what I heard. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just be very honest, and you know, the panelists, I'm always like the <laughs> I'm always the very um, realist person, right? I did not want to be a lawyer. I don't know that I would say I feel fulfilled like this, you know, like everybody seems super happy. And that's what I'm not, I'm, I'm very happy and I'm grateful, but you know, I think, <laughs> I think it's not always like rainbows. Right. And so, you know, I became a lawyer because my parents were like, well, welcome to America. I'll get a good job. That's a lawyer or a doctor for us. That was, that's what my parents were like, listen, those are more your options. Uh, so good luck. And, you know, when I did it, I started that I, I'm Costa Rican. I was not born in this country. I did not speak any English, go figure. Now I speak no Spanish. Um, and that's all intentional, right? Because we get here and they say, you don't have any papers, no more Spanish, fit in. And so we fit in so well that we lost chunks of who we were. Um, and so I think, you know, at nine or 10 years old, my parents were like, it's, you know, time to think of a career, which is crazy. And so it was becoming a lawyer. So I think I never thought of anything else. It was always, well, I need to become a lawyer because that's what that's what makes money here, right? That's what makes you rich, whatever that means. And um, you know, I think I went through law school and I'm grateful that I did, but it wasn't what I wanted to do ultimately. It, it wasn't really for me. So the, the beauty of the law though is that you nobody could take your degree from you. And there's so many, so many spaces uh professionally in a corporate setting that will give you that money, right? That purse for having a JD. And so I moved out of the practice of law and I obviously I remained a JD. But um, so when I when I joined the Hispanic Bar, there's a lot of non-practicing lawyers. And there's something a little bit, for what it's worth, shameful in the community. Like you're a lawyer, but you don't practice. Like, ah, like, like why not? And it's like, well, not every, not most CEOs are lawyers. You know, like there's a ton of accountants that are lawyers. Like, if, think of any job, they're usually JDs as well. And so it's silly for people to have this perception that you can only be one thing always forever, especially in the legal world where you can be everything, right? I could be an agent. I could be a real estate agent. I could do a million things with this degree that, you know, ultimately served me really well. And I think when I became the, the president of New York um, and I noticed a lot of younger lawyers coming up who just seemed very confused as to, it's not like law and order. It's just not like that. It's not a thing, <laughs> right? Like, and those people make like two cents, which is great. It's it's a public service job and it's amazing that people do it. But if you're trying to be rich, that's not where to go, right? And like, that's just not how it works. And so I think people want to say things that are really warm and fuzzy and make you feel great, but that's not the reality. And if people were a bit more honest about how things get done, you can cut off a ton of time. I have a friend of mine, a, men a mentee who just applied to law school and I don't think he wants to be a lawyer. And I told him, go. But be very clear, like you're going to come out with 200 grand in debt of a job that you don't want to do. And he signed, signed commitment papers moving, you know, somewhere across the country and told his parents, I don't want to go. And now it's like a whole thing. But the reality is he's doing himself a massive service by realizing now maybe this isn't for me. So, you know, I think highlighting to any folks in any space, any job you do, you know, it's it's not a one size fits all. Right. And, and you really the honesty of the journey, however you got there is really going to be incredibly helpful, you know, to, for your past, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I feel like when, you know, you just said, learning, being a lawyer doesn't fulfill you, but when you, I heard you say in rehearsal that when you um, had got the opportunity to be president of the Hispanic Bar Association, that you found like a, a mission in this way that felt maybe not fulfilling in your words, but better. Is that, it's is, not that I'm not feel, fulfilled. Let, let me just, accurate? yeah, I mean, it's not that I'm I'm not unfulfilled. I'm just saying in the practice of law, right, when in, in the way I think most people assume, you know, you go to work and you're on a computer and, you know, you're doing contracts or whatever it is that people see on TV. That's not really how it is. Um, that was not fulfilling for me. But obviously being, you know, a, a people person, a connector, kind of like everybody else here said, right, like reaching out to certain groups of folks. Um, and and making sure that people have, I mean, I, I met her earlier and I'm like, oh, I know somebody who can maybe help you, right? Like, cause I do. And she knows somebody who can maybe help me. And I would not be in that position to meet all of these different organizations and all these different folks had I not taken on this responsibility of being the president of New York. 
And so, you know, that is very fulfilling. And just to, you know, I am not unfulfilled in my life. <laughs> I live an awesome life, but, uh, you know, in, in the way that I think people assume, you know, I think same thing, like you, I always thought lawyers are very stiff and they wear suits and button up shirts and, you know, little, sh like little high heel shoes. And, you know, it's very like, it you sounds know, like open doors. It just opened doors. It's just yeah. not how it was for me. And I think that a lot of the younger generation, that's not how it is for them either. And they want to be able to see that it doesn't have to be that way. And it doesn't. Yeah. Kennedy, I wonder if you can talk about how leaning into these affinity networks can open other doors, like how you get showcased, how you might be able to, you talked earlier about how the CEO is your mentor and now he's invested in you. But I wonder, separate from like someone as big as the CEO, like what is even a low level advantage of someone just being a part of a group like this, just going to see what happens. I and think I when you join an affinity group, you find people that think like you, that go through the same situation that you have. A lot of, in a professional setting, you all want to elevate yourself. You want to be seen, you want to be acknowledged. And sometimes there's a struggle because sometimes we don't have that blueprint to move up in that in that space. And when you enter an affinity group, what you'll realize is that there's someone in that group that's made it a step further than you. And they're more than willing to educate you, teach you how to take that next step. And I think that that was one of the great things when I joined my affinity group was that they were like, look, you have all the skill set, but here are steps that you need to take in order to take it to that next level, how to get visible do this, do that. And I was like, okay, I got it. And what I realized is that, wait a minute, if they're sharing it with me, it's my responsibility to also share it with the next generation because my success is not guaranteed until I pass it forward. And I kind of made that my mission. Like, let me help the next generation any way I can. Let's, if we're not, if we're, if right now, if we have a, a, a lack of sharing of resources, let me try to fill that gap. Let's share, let's overshare. Because the more educated we are, the better we make decisions and the better we make moves within our communities and in the workplace. And a few of you, I think Christy talked about the education of it all, right? I think you just said your father had a third grade education. So it really is about that. Like we have different uh, opportunities. We've had different historical opportunities. And so what you're saying is like really taking it on educating in ways that we just aren't gonna learn because we haven't been exposed. A lot of us haven't been exposed, right? We might not have been able to take on free internships. We might not be able to do those things. So this is like a way that we can really take on something, get noticed, and also help the next generation. Um, and I wonder if, Chrissy, you could talk about that in, in your life. Like you you pivoted careers and figured that out and figured out how to lean into community. And I wonder if you could talk about your trajectory in a little bit. Yeah, happily. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I studied acting at NYU Tisch and had a, a mostly wonderful experience, right? Rolling on the floor, pretending I was vegan, I like to say, um, you know, imagining these stories. However, even in that space, um, after graduating, a group of us said, there are no roles out there for us, right? Um, one of the teachers said, oh, why don't you play a maid for one of the second year projects? And Really, I wasn't referred to Latine authors at the time. And upon graduating, a group of us said, let's start a theater group. So we launched the Movement Theater Company. And we've been wildly successful over 15 years, right? Just showcasing artists, creating our, our art in untraditional spaces, in hotel rooms, in parks, and um, creating circles just to write our story and taking power back by telling the stories that we want to tell, sharing joy, right, in, in various spaces. And that was really fulfilling. And um, I was temping and I ended up working at um, a luxury magazine. And I was thrown into this other world, other socioeconomic class. If you think um, uh, Betty La Fea or um, Just Shoot Me or any of those shows, it had tinkerings of that type of um, environment. And even through that, um, I found the beat of working with charities and being able to promote them in the magazine. And I was exposed to galas and event marketing. And I was able to go to the Hamptons and meet celebrities and um, create brand launches for um, these Fortune 500s. And so the trajectory of my life ripped open and opened up and I kept being redirected. And even in that, I was inviting some friends from Tish. I was like, come to the red carpet and take a photo. Let me see if I can get you in the magazine, right? And that was low level. 
And over time, I kept moving up and I found a calling in the nonprofit sector. And I used those skills. I leveraged all the learnings in the corporate sector to the nonprofit sector. And I helped um, the door uh, secure their first million dollar gala, which was huge. Um, that money went to children in need, right? Um, and so it's been a really fulfilling life. And I'm at this point in my career where I'm still a nonprofit. Um, shout out to the door. We have a student here um, actually recording. We we teach teens how to make movies, uh, get jobs and internships in entertainment and media. And, and so being able to use this platform and knowing that I'm a, a senior level employee, I now have access and opportunity, right? And so how do I leverage that seat? Now I'm at the table. So what can I do now that I'm here, right? How can I share that meal out with the others? And so that's what this is all about. Just, you know, listening to people's stories and also giving opportunity and access, giving permission to the next generation to sit alongside me, to come to these events that we all produce and to learn and that's that's my contribution so far. You let me know and we'll do more. <clears throat> no, I love what you said about um, you know, telling our stories. And I think that's like the first step. And then there's like the next couple of like telling our stories with our people in the way we want to tell them, like to our people. You know, there's so many steps in that direction. And I think um I wanted to bring it to Jacqueline to see, like, you know, it sounds like with Polamix, <laughs> with the theater company, you are disrupting kind of the traditional leadership model mm -hmm. and you're really opening up you're not just telling your story you're also doing it in a different way and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit how do you approach that yeah yeah um yes we we think of ourselves as hopefully disruptors and you know everyone's talking about the power of resource sharing and that's essentially what the Latinx theater comics is it's led by like I said a steering committee so I'm the producer for it but it's not like there's an artistic director who sets the, the tone for the season. It's really uh, us putting the ask out to the Latinx theater community and saying, what do you need? What resources do you need? What can we do to help? And then, and then using our resources to do that. Um, so being led by, by others and their ideas is at the core of what we do. We, we always share with folks what a commons is who may not know and, and a commons is a resource owned by no one for the benefit of a specific community mm -hmm. and so that's really how we like to approach our work interesting and I feel like everyone here is is approaching things differently and I want to make sure we hear from you so I wonder how um Lana I wonder how you're disrupting kind of the cultural norm in your work what leadership looks like in your work in that space in Latinx and sports. Yeah, so kind of what Kennedy was saying about, you know, paying it forward. A lot of our board members and those that are directors and, and higher within our community are very much on, once you climb the ladder, it's great, but I want to look back and see who else I can help. And that was something that was very important to us and something that a lot of those leaders that have the common mentality that we do for our organization, they continuously say, which I think is so important. Um, and I also was thinking about during our meditation, you talked about like the community that supports you when it's over. So there's, for example, today, there's a lot of layoffs at The Athletic, which is um, a journalism outlet in the sports industry. And, you know, thinking about those members and those that were affected by that, I know that our community rallies around those when, you know, you unexpectedly leave your job or, or lose your job and what is next. And I think that's something that's huge for us is providing those networking opportunities and kind of disrupting how we approach it because we're we're on zoom or we're in person and it's like hey i'm interested in one role and i know um one of our board members has helped uh someone in our community get jobs so really that's our like success stories and that's how we see our own success right like what you were saying kennedy it's not my success but it's like how i help others is how i i see my success and i think that's something that's that's huge for us to continue implementing within our within our organization Absolutely. And I feel like that transitions to what you're doing with the with um, the Bar Association, right? Like you're talking about mentoring the next generation. You're talking about like being real, telling them the advice, telling them your journey. Um, and I wonder what I wonder what advice as as someone who's leading Latinx organization, you would give mm -hmm. to folks that want to reclaim themselves sooner, like stay with themselves sooner. I heard you earlier say that you felt like you were reclaiming a part of yourself and people are reclaiming parts of yourself. And I wonder what advice you would give to like young people exploring law to kind of stick with that or find spaces sooner in their careers. 
we're pursuing anything really. I mean, I I don't think I have advice okay. for that. To be honest, I think um, I think that's a unfortunately learned model, right? And I think it's different for everybody. Um, the space that I work in is incredibly corporate. It's incredibly um, non-diverse, right? A lot of faces look exactly the same on the tippy top. It's across the board. Everybody's same color, around the same age, and typically the same sex. And so I think, you know, everybody's talking about being a disruptor. In my industry, the disruptors get fired, right? So you cannot, you can't go in there too crazy. Um, so I do think, you know, the advice is you have to see, I think that is an industry thing. I, I really do. I think that, you know, if you ultimately want to be a person who is a bit more free and can make more waves, then you need to not be, you know, at a, a, a you know, am law top five law firm. That's just not acceptable. Not for Latinos, not for Black people, not for white people, for anybody. That's just not their model. Um, and so I think, you know, if I guess the younger, and that, and we had this conversation on our on our prep call is, you know, I think the younger generations, I would tell, or younger folks, you know, be be a bit more free or sloppy with, with your career decisions in the beginning. You have every opportunity to, to find something else, right? So if you think you want to do something and you're like, oh, it's not enough money or I don't know if I'm going to like it. If you have nothing to really lose, then you have very, you know, only things to gain. Um, but I do think in the legal space, it is, it's not that way. And I do think you can only, you have to, it's like death by a thousand cuts, right? I showed up to work one day with my hair curly and I showed up one day with Jordans on, then one day with a biggie shirt. <laughs> and I'm waiting for them to be like, you've taken it too far, but um, so far so good. But it, you know, I think if you showed up with all these things at once, somebody had been like, wait a second. So I do think it, it really is, um, industry specific and you need to kind of know your audience wh wherever that is right in your industry it sounds like it's that slow that slow build like just try a little bit and see what you can get away with until you kind of say find your authentic self because I yeah. feel like you could not have started wearing Jordans to court I'm sure no I, I still <laughs> I'm sure still they're like Mr. Rodriguez I'm like I'm sorry but you know like <laughs> sorry but you know it just depends on on I also have to be on your personality right I'm I'm a I think I'm a playful person by nature. So if I was really serious, I'm like, I'm going to wear these shoes because I have my feet hurt. I think people would be like, get out of here. <laughs> like, they'd be like, put on different shoes and get out of here. Um, but I think it depends on how you approach people, right? And yeah. and we always talk about this, but like, likability goes so far, right? People want to give work to people they like. People want to mentor people that they like. People want mentors, like mentees want people that they feel like they can connect with. So, you know, I am not a stiff person. If you're looking for a stiff person, you know, if you are a person like that, or if you're an introvert, I'm probably not your, your cup of tea, you know, find somebody else. So I do think you kind of got to go for what you know best. Oh, absolutely. And I think that kind of transition just right. Like it's about making connections in these spaces and likability is like, is kind of, I don't know, it's, it's not an easily defined word. Right. And I wonder what folks on the panel might, I wonder what traits put you at an advantage when you go into these spaces that you might tell people, like if you're going into an affinity space and you want to advance your career, what do people look for? Like, like ability, but what does that mean? I think I'm curious to know what people think um, for your opinions on the panel. Maybe we start with uh, Christy, what do you think? I'd say leading with curiosity and really a big thing is reliability, right? People may not know what one is capable of, but if you, you show up regularly to the meetings, you participate, you say what you're going to do and you follow through over time, people are like, oh, that's somebody worth keeping in touch with. And that's really how I've navigated this universe, right? I keep in. I'm like, I'm at the meeting. Hey, you don't know me yet, but I'm awesome. <laughs> Wait till you catch up, you know, and over time that trust builds, right? And how can one add value in those spaces, right? Lead with curiosity and add value where you can. I also feel that where you can also add value is that you have a voice. Use that voice. Um, one thing that I always learned, and I'll just go to a quick story. Um, when I was working, I was very quiet because sometimes in our culture, they tell you, hey, Put your head down and just work. Don't make noise. Don't be recognized. You know, that's don't don't put your job at jeopardy because el miedo, you know, el miedo de perder el trabajo. And for a long time, that's what I did. And I would, funny enough, I would go to these comp meetings in a conference room with all these directors and producers, and I would sit in the corner. I wouldn't sit at the table. And after one meeting, I had some, I didn't, raised my hand. I didn't contribute to that meeting. And I was just talking to another colleague and I was just vexing 
you know, I had opinions and I never shared them. I was just sharing it with him. And as I was sharing it with my colleague, the director was at, at the door and overheard me. And he told me, why didn't you ask, why didn't you question what was happening? Because you, you are in this room for a reason. You're supposed to, you're providing perspective. You are an employee. You're someone who can, who can contribute. And I kind of brushed them off. The next week, the meeting happened again. I stayed in my corner, did nothing, very quiet. This time, the director did not play around. He, he was like, Kennedy, what do you have to say? What are your thoughts? And I just, honestly, I gave my opinion. And when I gave my opinion and I started seeing people shake their heads like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's a different point of view. That's when I realized that I was in that room for a reason. I was someone who can contribute. And that would never have happened if I didn't, if that director had not given me my voice. And I think as us as Latino leaders, we're representatives of our culture in the workplace. And sometimes we have to be loud. We have to be heard. And I think that each one of us do it in a unique way. Sometimes it's flashy. Sometimes- Well, why did I get the flashy? <laughs> but we all hear for a difference. I think that for us, it's just about bettering our community. And the way to do that is to say something, do something. Absolutely. I wonder if um, Jacqueline or Lana, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, I would say being genuine, um, like making authentic relationships with folks and being invested and in also what they're bringing. Um, I always like to remind myself and others of like recognizing the innate value that we all bring to the table, which I think is also part of like a common space approach of we all have something to bring. And so when you're in these spaces, in these conversations, um, not only thinking about, oh, how am I going to move like my own agenda forward, but also how can I help other people? Like, how can we back to like, how can we share resources to help each other out? Um, so I think that's important. I think all amazing points, um, kind of going off of the authentic as well. Something that I talk about a lot, Latinx and sports, but also when I have networking calls with, you know, uh, aspiring industry professionals is authentic networking. I think when I was in college, I was very much taught you reach out to someone because you applied to a job, you're going to talk to them. And at the end, you're going to say, hey, by the way, I applied. Thanks. You know, can you recommend me? And that's it. And I feel like and my mom is a very huge proponent of this is that people love to talk about themselves but not only that we I think as a culture love to talk in general I do not shut up and it is true uh, so I think you know being authentic is something that's so important for us because at the end of the day like these affinity networks are the safe space for those of our culture and to talk about you know their struggles at work do they want to apply to a new job do they want to try something different like do they want to bring in different resources or other opinions and different things like that that's so important to be that safe space for them um, so yeah, just being authentic. And when we have our networking calls and stuff, you know, I'm very casual. I'm like, hey, like, here's your three topic questions. But if you want to talk about what's going on in F1 or whatever you, you know, you see fit in your small groups, please go for it. And I think coming out of those small groups, then it's about like the follow ups and being like, hey, I, you know, really enjoyed meeting you. And, you know, those can lead to jobs or interviews or all things like that. So I think being authentic is something that we all appreciate in general and something that really takes um, someone very far. Absolutely. And I think even for myself, I think about how the Latinx alumni network has impacted my life. It was like a safe space for me to create and create events like this. And I've reached out to folks all over the world to come in and, and have these healing events. And now you are all here. And I think it's really, what's really beautiful about these spaces to me is that it gives you space to move in different directions. It gives you space to experiment. People are more empathetic in these spaces because they want to teach you. They want you to succeed. And I think um, for me, a big lesson around being in this space is, has been that there's room for that. There's not always room for that in other spaces. There's not always room for that in your job to experiment. And so I wonder, um, yeah, I wonder if anyone has thoughts on how people can use these spaces in unique ways, not just to get noticed for your skills, but how you can authentically network, like what, what that looks like. What could that look like in just a, with throwing, the, throwing the networking out of the way? Like, what can you get out of these spaces? Or what have you seen come out of these spaces that you maybe couldn't have expected? Or, um, yeah, I'm curious if anyone has thoughts or. So I just want to, you said something and it, it, it followed up on something that Kennedy oh, sure. said about how being in an affinity group can help you, you know, getting to the CEO. Or I think what, what he was alluding to, and I, you know, I guess 
it's what I do professionally is folks in affinity groups have opportunities to flex skill sets that they don't actually have that have not been cultivated, right? So like you went to school and you are a director and that's what you do and that's your day job. But you also maybe wanted to try marketing and you're not going to leave your job to go try marketing. But in an affinity group, you know, if if I say, hey guys, I need somebody to come up with a presentation because we have a pitch and somebody volunteers, I don't expect you to like ace it. Um, People in that space are going to mentor you and you can realize, oh my God, I actually really like this, right? And then you find people in that network that you're like, all right, well, I think I really liked this. Can I do the next one with you? And the next one, and then before you know it, maybe it's a, maybe I want a career shift, but maybe it turns out this is, I like this better. So, you know, on top, on top of getting to the CEO or meeting other people, you do have an opportunity to try things that you would not otherwise feel comfortable to try because you don't want to mess it up. And it, you don't want to get fired. You don't want to get called out for you know garbage work. Um, so it does help you a lot in that space. And then I'm just going to answer your question because I'm still yeah, talking. But um, the other thing I think I've gotten from affinity groups because you know although it's it's a an affinity group is a group of folks that are like minded. We're not same minded, right? And same minded makes you flat. If everybody had the same thought, we'd never do anything. So there's d- different approaches even in the collective group of similar people. Everybody has different. I had a meeting at my house this week and it was an ongoing joke. So I'm Costa Rican. My husband's Dominican. He's also a lawyer. There's a bunch of Latin lawyers at my house and everybody's like, well, uh, Costa Rican empanadas are better. Now Dominican empanadas are better. You know, and it was like a whole group of people that were like, well, we started it and we have this in it. And it was like a joke, but everybody thinks whatever they want to think. And so for me, I think friendship has come out of this stuff that I never would have expected um, an authentic friendship, not based necessarily on, on similarities because a lot of us have some similarities but even in the differences in the I'm a mom of three um I'm really you know I'm a I'm a relatively I'm a I'm a relatively high person in my career I'm incredibly maxed with time and so seeing other moms do things that I'm like how the hell do you do this right like things that are not necessarily work related but they're life related and I want somebody else's roadmap because I don't know what I'm doing um and I I don't want people to pretend because I know there are people under me that think I know what I'm doing. And I don't pretend I'm like, yo, I don't know what I'm doing. It's working so far, but like this, I, I'm stumbling into all this stuff. And so the friendships that these groups provide, you know, in, in their, their reciprocal things I can give you and things you give me that you don't even know you give me. Like even talking to you guys in the audience, a couple of things I've said, I've seen people like shake their heads. Like, yeah, I feel that. And so, you know, like to Kennedy's point, this, the, the, the director who will pull somebody to the side and say, oh, I, I noticed that you vibed me there. You must not speak Spanish either, or whatever. Um, you know, I think those things really matter when you talk to people, like noticing people's behaviors. And that's a job for all of us to take on, right? Not just do your part, you know, sit back. If you want to be a, a changer or like a leader in anything, you have to actually step up and, and lead. That, that, that's it. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, does anyone else anything you want to add? I think what she said is on point. Mm-hmm. It really does. It does. Affinity groups really does allow you to flex your muscles. I never thought that I would be at, in this situation. I never thought I'd be a leader. For me, I've always been a personally. I've always been a loner. I'm a very conservative person. But where I felt that there was a lack in the community, I had to take a lead. I had to take a lead. As uncomfortable as it was for me. I had to do it. And sometimes that's what the affinity groups are there, their support system. And the like-mindedness is pretty cool because when you want to take that leap, they're there to support you. And you and having that support is all it it's it means the world. Because that means that they have your back regardless of what happens, they are there to help you along the way. And I've been fortunate enough with Vecinos is that I started this with five corp five corporations. And the fact that it's grown so much just from us to having conversations and me being there for Patricia and working with Christy and then just meeting Jacqueline not too long ago and then Alana coming into the group not too long ago. We just continue to evolve. And the whole point is to just elevate each other. I think that's what, it's fantastic. Thanks for adding that. Alana, I wonder if you can elaborate on, on Latinx and sports kind of in that theme because I feel like there's no under much underrepresentation of Latinos playing sports, but certainly behind the scenes. Yeah. And I wonder if you can talk about how I wonder if you can talk about how you learned how to flex your muscles, your skill set, and put it into this 
a thing that you created. Yeah, I think um, I echo Kennedy very much as I did not think I would be in this position one bit. So uh, we started, you know, during the pandemic, 2020 on Zoom, like never did I think we would have in-person events at SoFi, at the MLB office before I joined. Like there's just been so many opportunities that have presented itself purely from people wanting to support us and to help us. And I think that is the best thing that I have gotten out of out of our group is just seeing like the support and the community because I think we we always knew it was there, but to actually see it come to fruition and the different things we're able to put on has been so important. And kind of what Patricia said, I have some of the best as a friend because of this group. Like I travel to all these different places with my job or just personally, and I get to just see people that I've known on Zoom for years. And I actually get to see them in person. I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember when you got this job or you did this. And just to like be able to make those connections that started out virtually to now in person is something so big for us. But I mean, like you were saying, it's definitely underrepresented, you know, behind the scenes. And I think something that a lot of organizations have put into play is that they want to now match their front office to what is going on on the field. So I think a lot of more teams and leagues are really listening to what is going on with like their players. Like I had one of my friends today, she works, I think in marketing and she's translating the social in Spanish for her team, because there's no one in that on the social team that speaks Spanish. Like those are very real things that I think organizations don't really know that they need until they put into practice or like oh this is a gap that needs to be fulfilled because we can't really keep punting it to like somebody else that we know um I think another common term too is like being like the token Latino is very real um because you might be one of five or one of one so that's something as well that you know it's a lot of responsibility kind of like what you you guys were saying you know it's like we're now like the focus group for our organizations and I think it's very important to share those ideas and a lot of organizations come to Latinx and they're like hey we want to like put our jobs on your social pages, or we want to have you come in to talk to a DEI group. That's how I met Kennedy. Um, so really being able to be provided these opportunities from something that really came from social media to now and kind of be seen as a consultant or some sort of expert. Like a lot of times people are like, oh, you're an expert in this space. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I just like learned along the way. And there's a lot of people that gave me their opinions. And, you know, we really listen to our community similar to you, you know, we have a board and there's two of us at the top, but really at the end of the day, like we sent emails and surveys. We're like, what do you want? Because at the end of the day, I came out of grad school and created this, but there was people in the, in the industry that wish that they had this. And I was like, okay, you're C-suite. What do you want to like see like come out of this? And I think really listening to all the different communities and age groups and, and industry experience within us is something that's very important as well that we want to be able to serve. Yeah. And it's really, what I keep hearing is like, we're in a different position of power now. Like people want to match the back office of the front office. And I, I think affinity spaces, it sounds like are a great space to make yourself seen as someone that can fill that role and also do everything else we've talked about, right? Um, and I wonder how I wonder how that applies to theater. I wonder how that applies to how you've seen it grow, how you've seen partners come to you, what you see, um, if you see like a, a growing need, how, just how that has evolved in your sector. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the LTC and the people that are on the steering and advisory committee is that, you know, it's a, it's a volunteer, an advisory board and so everyone holds different positions in their day jobs um so christy is part of it we have people who work for universities there are actors there are people who work for theater companies there are people who work for healthcare companies and like theater is their passion and so they serve on on our committees and i think what i see is that um opportunity to build mentorship and to build those skills like oftentimes these people when they're in their organizations, they're very siloed. They are the only Latina person in their organization or one of a few. And so we all get to come together and like talk about things that we don't often get to talk about in our organizations because we might get like, get the boot, you know? Um, and so we provide hopefully that safe space for, for conversations to happen and for people to, to dabble into different things and, and make connections for someone who, is just graduated for undergrad to be able to talk to a dean at a university for grad school because everyone serves on the same committee and because when we come together we kind of try to throw our titles out the window and it's just like we're all we're all on the same playing field now like nobody is up here nobody is down here we're all just like share the same values which is really awesome like kennedy was saying like when you're part of the ltc it, there's like a common understanding that we all share the same values of a common space approach 
and like moving the field forward without having so many hierarchical structures because we all have an innate value. That's the most important thing, right? Finding value aligned folks, yeah. finding value aligned communities. And I think these spaces can really just take the first step off of that. Like you're poor Latinos, Latinx people, we can move there. Um, I want to just say that we're going to open it up for questions soon. So if you have questions, keep them in your mind. Zoom folks, you can, I'm not sick. I sound sick. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Zoom, Zoom folks, um, if you can place your questions in the chat, I will get them eventually. Um, I wonder if everyone keeps talking about, and this is my experience too, being, you know, one of a few or the only in your workspace or in other spaces. And we've talked about the personal impacts of these spaces on you, but I wonder if you can dig in a little bit more on how this impact, how these spaces have impacted you beyond the friendship center, but impacted you personally and your community personally. Um, and maybe we start, maybe we start with uh, Kennedy. With the community. Um, I think that's something for me was, at least in the last year or so, um, being part of Asinos, I realized that we had a voice and we can help, we can help a lot of nonprofits in the community. A lot of the, a lot of these nonprofits were impacted because of the uh, because of the pandemic, and they're struggling to survive, like Teatro Sea, and Teatro Ciclo, and Love Mentoring, and Dream. And one thing that I did was this year I made one of the goals for Vecinos was how to help these nonprofits survive and evolve. A lot of times, as corporations, we support you know ref, uh, you know Salvation Army, all these big nonprofits, but there's a lot of com a lot of local communities nonprofits that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting within our communities that don't get the same amount of support. And what I did this year to kind of start bridging that, bridging that gap was that I invited a lot of these corporate heads to a meeting. And I brought a lot of these nonprofits here to the meeting as well. And I had each one of those nonprofits present to all these corporate heads. And I think for me, it was about, look, there's a lot of good people trying to make a difference in our communities. And if you don't see them, you don't know they're there. And for me, it was about connecting those two because if you have all this money, all this investment that you're already, you're giving to other, all these big nonprofits, well, the little nonprofits also need that help. The same ones that are in your backyard, um, that are right down the block from your offices. How do you build that relationship, that honesty? And how do you grow that? And for me, that was one of the goals this year is really to elevate each of these non local nonprofits to get to continue doing the job that they, they've always wanted to do or they've been trying to do. <clears throat> Sorry. Helen, well, anyone else wants to jump in? Thank you for that answer. Well, I wanted to add that um, in addition to that with NYU, community service is really such a core value right? And culturally, as Latina people, um, being going and volunteering at your church or um, your local food bank, um, helping your neighbor, bringing food down the block to the, to the elderly person that lives there, we're a very giving culture. And so with the Latina, with the NYU Latina uh, Alumni Network, we said, how can we leverage our position to do the same, right? To forge these partnerships to create visibility and to get folks to be able to give back beyond the holidays, but throughout the entire year, right? And and people are in need 365 days. So how can we use our position to help better um, those in need and those impacted by whatever um, is affecting them? So it's really such a privilege to learn. <clears throat> I wonder if anyone else has thoughts on yeah, like I, what I hear is I what I heard Kennedy, you named your specific goal this year. Just you just named our our priority of um, giving back, and I wonder if there's a, a top goal that everyone had in their organizations beyond just representation. Even recently, how you, how that's evolved and and where you're going next, where you're trying to go. Maybe we start with you, Patricia. Um, yeah, I think I think my goal is is very so it's a long game, uh, and we've I think we've spoken about this all of us. Um, but one of my goals is to, to make a collective hook for my kids, for our kids. I think if you think about other spaces, other ethnicities, you know, the, the, the community, the, the husband has a friend who's a judge. So their son can get an internship easy, 
or I know a dent, my friend works at this school and I, I can get, I can get you in this private school. And because we're kind of starting a little bit on the, some of us on the floor, we don't have that group of folks. So I can say, oh, my friend works at Princeton and my son is trying to get in. So I can see if I can get you an interview. And as I continue to get older and, you know, my, I evolve in my career and I meet not just people my age, you know, older than me, younger than me, we all have hooks that we can literally provide each other where I can say, you know, like, so I have two, I have twins that are seven and my son is eight. And they all want to go to Princeton, right? And then we talk about how my parents sold me at nine, right? I guess it's, you know, Apple didn't fall too far from the tree. So the goal is, you know, when and if they decide they want to do whatever, I have somebody that I can literally call and say, hey, my kid wants to, like my son is, is into cartooning. And I know somebody who's a cartoonist. Like that would never have, like that's just the most random thing. And it's not law-based. It's just being able to provide hooks for people creating a network of professionals in, it, that looks similar to us, that have similar goals and values. And, you know, the way that I mother is very different than the way other people mother. But it's probably, it's the way that most people that are like me mother, right? So like shy of, you know, excluding other people, like there is a lot of commonalities in, in, in culture. And so being able to have that network of folks that can support not just you, but your kids, your kids' kids, your friend's kid, your neighbor, whoever, you know, Kennedy calls me and he's like, my kid needs an internship. I'll just make one up. <laughs> I mean, like legit, I'll just be like, all right, like I'll bring her, like bring him. Right. And, um, and I'm lucky enough to have that kind of clout right now, but I didn't have that 10 years ago, you know, and I hope that that continues on. The one other thing I want to say, cause it'll bother me if I don't say it, but sorry, I always go yes. this sideways, but you know, the idea in my space, my career, and I'm sure it's a lot of other, other spaces as well, but I feel like a lot of minority people think, well, there can only be one top dog, top lawyer, Latin lawyer, it's only one in my company. So it's me and you, like, I'm going to fight against you. And so we're not allies right now, you know, so maybe we show up to the affinity group, but I'm like, yo, at the end of the day, like, I'm going to crush you and I'm going to become partner and, you know, like, get out of my way. That's not, a, it doesn't have to be a thing. And it is a, a thing for a lot of people. A lot of folks feel like, you know, we have to work harder to get recognition in certain spaces. I can't mess up as much as other people can because more eyes are on me. Um, and that's, I think, depending on where you are, that's a real thing that actually happens that people are like, uh, well, you know, English was your first language or because you have a bunch of, you know, grammatical errors. And it's like, well, this guy had a bunch too. And like, nobody said anything about it. Right. Um, so I do think also trying to remind yourself, because I go through this myself and it's part of what I do in my organization is like thousands of lawyers, not just women, but all Latino lawyers, um, that we remind ourselves to not be that way. It doesn't have to be you or me, right? It could literally be me first, then I'm going to grab you up, right? And then we grab the person underneath. Um, and I think we're trained to think that way. Like our families are like, it's one, right? Like you be, that's, that's your spot, push them out of the way. It doesn't have to be that way. Oh, thanks for saying that. I feel like that's a that's a really common theme across the board of, of uh, gatekeeping and feeling like there's one space for certain people, but there is space for everyone. We've just been taught that there isn't. I think it's really important to distinguish. Um, I want to get back to. I just want to make sure we talk about goals for everyone. So maybe if you want to continue. Yeah, sure. So like I mentioned, the LTC is. Uh, about 10 years old now. So we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary celebration and thinking about all the work we've done, but also about all the work we've yet to do and that we want to do and what the next 10 years looks like. And all of our programming, like I said, is really decided by the field and the people who want to contribute to the LTC. And so we'll be opening up proposals for people to pitch us programming that they, uh, believe aligns with our values and could use our resources for. So if anyone's like here is interested in theater or in the Zoom room interested in theater, highly encourage um you can reach out to me or go on our website because that that we will be releasing that soon to think through um our next uh few years of programming, which is really exciting and thinking through how we can continue to push boundaries because there's so much work to to be done still. So many boundaries to push in yes. all directions. Yes. <laughs> so that was amazing. What are your focus on? Yeah, so for Latin X and Sports, um, I kind of said in our intro, but we are a soon to be nonprofit. So that's definitely like top goal for this year is to complete our process. We started it late last year, so that's our big number one. Um, but kind of related to that, our 
one of our really big missions is to create um, grant programs. And Christy kind of touched on it. Unpaid internships, especially in the sports industry, is something that is very real. And I think it is a large hurdle that our culture needs has to overcome or can't overcome. And then it like sets us back because, you know, all these internships are to get the experience. So then you can apply to a full-time job and then you, you know, climb up. But if these unpaid internships, you know, could continue to persist, then we're, we might not be able to take on that experience to continue learning. So we want to be able to create some sort of grant or like stipend for a college students that are looking to break into the sports industry and taking on those internships, whether unpaid or very minimum wage pay. Um, so that's something that's really big for us to kind of support our community to be able to get the experience, but being able to also know that there's some sort of like financial backing to it when unfortunately the organization team university, whatever it may be, may not offer that to you, you're still able to take on that opportunity and not, you know, I guess, like set yourself back in other ways, which is something that's very big for us. Um, and then also just continuing to grow our different regions and our different database just all over the country, LA and New York and Arizona are very large for us. And I kind of also said at the beginning, Texas is an event that we're going to put on in July. And we also have eyes on Florida. So really trying to be now intentional with where we continue to grow and make all these different events and spaces so that we soon become all over the country. We have people in Mexico and Canada also didn't, didn't think about that um, when we started out. So we've definitely somehow gone internationally, but want to continue being able to grow here and be very intentional where the places that we go in the future. Um, <clears throat> that all makes a lot of sense. And I just, I keep hearing kind of this, this theme of like, it just doesn't have to be the way we've been taught it is, right? Internships don't have to be unpaid the way I, the way a lot of us did. Like it's, it sets us back, it's a barrier and it's harder for us and creating grants, being creative about everything that's happening here is, um, it changes the norm, which isn't the norm, it's just what we've been taught as the norm. So thanks for everything you all are doing. It's really impactful. Um, I wonder if there are any questions in the room or in this, not in the Zoom room, but any questions in the room? I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> um, did anyone come here to say something that hasn't been said? Did one on your way? Were you like, I, this is the point I want to make? <laughs> or coming up now? I always got something. You have a question? <laughs> oh, have a question. Uh, I mean, oh, uh, hi. Hi, thanks. No, I mean, I'm just super fascinated by it. I think it's amazing. I'm very happy. And and I think just uh, I think the last thing to say is that we need to build like a physical country club in the castle. Like, oh, okay. I mean, we need to get like 200 <laughs> acres of land. There's no country club for us. Yet. Tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the next step. <laughs> that sounds fun. That's really good. This could be for anyone. Um, I was just thinking about it because. Uh, you were mentioning how you were redirected throughout the your career as a public tech. Were there any roadblocks or anything that you guys have faced that kind of made you um, where you are now that really pivoted you towards it? I know you guys kind of mentioned or alluded to it at times, but anything specific that you can think off the top of your mind? What, what are you referencing? Career like, path? Yeah, career path or just where you were, you know, you talked about the casinos, like well, what was it in that? I know you mentioned it before, like you felt like you didn't have a voice, um, but is there something else that you can think of or something that you specifically were like, okay, like this, let me create this. It could be that or like career wise. Like you also mentioned about how you were like not talking, so someone has to kind of put you in that spot. Like, yeah. you know, I have a roadblock off the top of my money. Money. I had $250,000 of student loan debt that I paid for by myself. I got married. I had three kids in a year and a half and I could no longer try fun jobs. Like I was like, oh shit, I have to make this amount of money to do, to, to survive. Right. And so, you know, there, my career moved in a space in which I had to make this kind of money. So I could no longer explore things that maybe were of more interest because I needed to maintain this thing I kind of created. And then, you know, everybody jokes around, but like the more you make, the more you spend and it gets worse and worse and, you know, which is a, is a, it's a gift, right? So not to say, it, but, you know, I do think when you're thinking about career shifts and how that works and very intentional in the spaces you drop yourself in, like I tell younger people now, or even people might, or anybody, if you're going to take a $60,000 pay cut, make sure you can ma maintain that. If you're going to take a $60,000 increase, which is great. Make sure that if this job, you get laid off, hell are you going to do if you're scrambling and your skill set didn't really actually allow you to, you know, like you didn't make, you, you hadn't learned enough to maintain that. Um, so I do think money does unfortunately dictate a lot of your career path. 
And people don't want to say that because it sounds ugly and it sounds like you're being greedy, but that's just reality. And as you get older and you buy a house or you have a car note or you have insurance or any grown up, grown up being a grown up is not what's tracked tra tra up to be. It kind of sucks. <laughs> so you got to pay for everything. So, you know, I think that creates a lot of hurdles because yeah. things that you might have considered, you just can't anymore. Yeah. Glad you shared that because I, I made about undergrad, I came out with a bunch of loans and stuff like that. I felt like I paid off myself. And then later on, now like I'm debt free, but I still think about like, do I really want to? Well, that's amazing, debt first of all. Debt free, yeah, that's, that's huge. Really, yeah, like there's another one back at my house. So I'm glad you brought that up as a yeah. Yeah, connection there. I think for me personally, was I got frustrated in the workplace. I had been a manager for a long time and I kept getting skipped over for director roles. I, I had been there longer than a lot of the employees. I had trained some interns that became coordinators, that became managers, that became directors ahead of me. And it became frustrated. It was like, what am I doing wrong? And what I realized, it was not me. It was just that I was not visible. And, it, and the only way to get visible, I didn't know how to become visible because me personally being a conservative person, being a quiet person, I needed to come out of my shell if I wanted to evolve. And the only way to evolve, I didn't have a blueprint. I didn't have mentors. So I had to go search for them. And for the, me, it was like, where do I start? And it started with affinity groups. And those affinity groups kind of opened those doors for me little by little. And now I've been, I've graduated to being a director. Now, now I'm in line to be a senior director. And the lanes, the possibilities are open and I'm more confident about it. And sometimes it's about that. Sometimes when you're in the workplace, you struggle to evolve. And sometimes you need resources. And the affinity groups became that. Because sometimes, let's be honest, our HRs don't, sometimes they help you out, sometimes they don't. And you have to find other avenues to make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you want to say something? Oh, no, no. Then if your company doesn't have one, then you call us and we make one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how it started, right? And I think so many industries, I mean, even me, I used to have, I used to be in film and there's no HR to go to when someone is, you know, exploiting you in this way. You know, it's it's been, when I think about my own transition, career transition, it's been different spaces that, affinity spaces, not just uh, next spaces, but affinity spaces that I've gone to to explore transitioning because there wasn't that net, there wasn't that background um, where I was previously. Is it other, any other? Yeah, that's common. I think uh, one of the worries that I've got in these groups is that you get to meet other people. I mean, at least for me, I walk away thinking, okay, I'm not the only one. Okay, sometimes not, nothing specific. It's just that you're part of it, something that you were not aware of. You see other people that are making it. And that kind of gives you the impetus. Wait a minute, let me find out. This I did not know that. But many groups like that, sometimes nothing specific. It's just be part of something that you were not aware of. And that I in conferences stuff like that, I woke up and be like, hey, I'm not the only one. So I can come back and retool and move on. So that I think is the value that I find in this group. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that. So we're getting a little low on time. So I want to uh, ask everyone to speak one last time, either with something that you came here to say, or um, did I see your hand go up? No, I'm <laughs> with something that you came here to say, or with, we've said a lot. One thing that you really want us to take away from you being here, you came here today, you gave us your time. We heard what we heard, but what is your intention that we leave with um, before we close? I say my intention is start building a network of allies that'll have your back through thick and thin. For us, we chose affinity groups because they helped us evolve, but it can be a colleague right next to you. It could be your best friend. You don't know how big of a network you have unless you, until you start reaching out to folks and asking for help. And I think that's always been a big thing for me. You know, vecinos, we, for me, vecinos are just a network of a whole bunch of Latino colleagues that are helping each other evolve. And I think for you guys, we kind of all joined for not similar reasons, but something along those same lines. I think that's what I probably would want to take it. My advice for you guys, grow your network. Because when the time comes that you need help, have, have someone there that you can reach out to to help you out along the way, because you need that allyship. Okay, go ahead. Or anyone um, else who feels present. Did anybody have, I don't have anything else. <laughs> I would just say, 
believe in yourself and trust that you know, like trust your skill set. I've had people tell me before, like that I couldn't have X jobs because they didn't think I could do them when they've never seen me do it or given me the opportunity to do it. And it's really frustrating because you're like, you're not even giving me a chance. You're not even having a conversation about it. Um, so I've told folks before, like, never let someone tell you you can't do a job that they've never seen you do or given you the opportunity to do. Go find somewhere else that will let you that will let you explore that. Thank you. I'd say if you have an interest, find an event, a meetup group, um, talk to friends, and go explore. If you found that you always like photography or taking pictures, sign up for a photography class, find other people who take photos. And over time, you'll build a community of photographers. And who knows, maybe you'll start doing weddings and you have a side hustle. But all that to say that uh, for me, it was community and being in spaces with um, other Latine folk, other um, spirited folks who love to give back and love to have a good time. And um, at the core, that's my heart. And so um, um, I think of celebrities like JLo. Um, she has her glam squad. I say, create your own version of glam squad for yourself. You're the CEO of your life, right? So who do you need to hype you up? Who do you need to help you with your makeup, with your outfit? Who do you need to um, you know, give you mentorship or guidance or teach you skills for interviewing? Build that community, find them, go on Instagram, go to these networking events, introduce yourself and it'll come. That is the best example I have ever heard. Yeah, I love it. I, that was great. That makes sense. <laughs> I'm gonna use it everywhere. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna definitely use it again. Um, I think for me, it's about like, be you. Like Patricia said, she wears Jordan support. I wear sneakers in the office every day. And I'm, I embrace it because it's part of me and that's part of like who I am. And I think there's a lot of value in being authentic within yourself because you never know who else wants to be authentic, but maybe never found that coworker or that friend to like be like in a safe space with. So building those like relationships based off what you, you believe to be true and the things that you like, even outside of like the workplace and things like that can go so far to make friends with coworkers or other colleagues in the same industry as you, or even different industries that you're interested in. So I think that's the biggest thing is to always remember to be authentic and, and be yourself because that's the most important version of, your, of yourself. Mm -hmm. I got something now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal everybody's. But I think um, being open-minded is is incredibly important. And I think for me, there was many years in my life where I wasn't op as open-minded, right? Like I just assumed, well, you look white, so you must be white. You're pregnant, so it must have been easy for you. I had no idea if you were an IVF baby. Look, I had no idea. I don't know. I don't know you. Like, I don't know how this worked out for you. Um, I would see people with a beautiful house, and I'm like, oh, they must be rich. Well, it turns out that their, you know, their parent passed away. And they fell into bed, you know, money that they would have rather not had. So being open-minded about people you meet, I think first impressions are horribly important, but they're not everything. And sometimes people rub you the wrong way or they just something about them you're like uh you're not for me but you don't know if they had a shitty day they missed the bus they have eight dollars in the bank you have no idea so being open-minded about people um trying your best to meet people where they present themselves and if you see any sort of good and you want to like poke at it do it because you just don't know who you'll connect with you don't know like i i met kennedy last year at an event like a random event and then we were like, oh, I could do this for you. I could do this for you. Like you're talking about your nonprofit. I'm like, you need a lawyer because I can help you do that. Like you just never know what people, where they can fit into your life. And I don't mean to what you can get from them to physically use, but you just never know. So be open-minded about, you know, people and, and how they come off and, and, you know, don't make assumptions that are likely horribly untrue. Thank you. <clears throat> All excellent advice. Um, I just want to confirm, is there a question, DJ, someone? Somebody's hands up there. Oh, maybe go ahead. Go ahead. Let me ask it out here. I think they have to unmute. So okay. give me one second. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, EJ. Um, but please go ahead. Well, hey everyone. My name is Tatiana. Um, class of 99 and okay. Thank you so much for having this panel. Um so my question is: I think you're all great. I think your organizations are all excellent. 
but how are you strategically leveraging each other? And because there's a lot of us doing this work for years in the room and also online. So it's great that we've achieved all of this and it's wonderful, but what's the next step and how can we move even higher? I think for us, the next step is to create a pipeline for the next generation. But for us, one of my long-term goals is to become an incubator. I want to I want to educate the next very similar to Alana. There's a lot of Latino kids that are coming up without the experiences or the knowledge to enter the workplace, and I want to be able to educate them and prepare them to enter the workplace because I don't want them to go through the same struggles I went through. I want them to once they enter the workplace, I want them to take off and excel because a lot of times my struggles should not be their struggles, and the only way to do that is to educate. And in order to do that, you also have to invest time and resources. Like something I'm doing this summer, starting in July, is we Warner Brothers Discovery teamed up with the New York Public School System, and we're taking 160 kids and teaching them how to create marketing campaigns. For five weeks, I got to sit there and educate these kids from A to Z. But that's, a, that's an invaluable lesson. How many of us would love to go into marketing? and develop that skill set. A lot of us don't get that experience until we work in the workplace. These kids are getting it at the high school level. And for me, it's really about building that pipeline. Hey, how can I, how can I elevate our culture 1%? How can I make them 1% better? And it's never easy, you know? For me, I, at least personally for me, I see my struggles and, I've, and I wanna make the, next, the person who's following my kids that are entering the workplace better prepared so we can compete. Because I think that if we are ever given the opportunity to enter the workplace at the same rate as everyone else, we can we can beat them. It's not it's not a competition, I would say, but we want to be a part of the dynamic. We want to be game changers, and the only way to do that is to educate our kids and create that pipeline. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything you want to add to that? No. I mean, I think I think it's not for me and. In... It's not just kids, right? I think it's everybody, every age. There's a ton of folks. And it, it's almost the reverse, right? The older generation of folks that are so ingrained in old school mentality uh, in that put your head down, right? Like in the, uh, I'm the woman at the workplace. So I'll bring the cake for the birthdays. I don't want to bring the cake. You bring the cake on my birthday. Like these old school thoughts, like, and that is who you are. Those are systemic stereotypes that are layered generationally, like, over and over. So, you know, for me, the next step is figuring out a way to help break those kinds of thought processes at, at your workplace, wherever it is that you work, because it, a lot of how I behave at work is how my mother was like, make sure you do this. Like you never leave without lipstick on, right? You can be in sweats, but you never leave with your hair looking like, like silly things, but you know, that ultimately turns into work stuff, right? And these, these old school thoughts, um, so I think breaking out of those norms at any age, at any phase in your career will help us feel um, more into our own skin, whatever that is for you, right? Like it doesn't have to be the same, but I think that's super important. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else have anything to add? I probably just want to add, acknowledge that there's a lot of organizations that are doing a lot of this work in the community. Mm -hmm. For us, and, <laughs> no, 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 and it is true. Look, there's been a lot of organizations. I think for us, it's very similar. We just were not aware. Yeah. And us not being aware, we were like, you know what? Something is missing. And we decided to create that within the workplace. But there's a lot. There's a Hispanic star, Hispanic Federation, Latinista. You name them, they exist. And we have to support them all. And that, that's the, even, I support them as much as I try to evolve, as, as much as I try to do stuff for casinos. Why? Because we are all trying to accomplish the same thing. And that's to make a difference in the community. And if I may follow up with a comment as to the reason why I ask the question is because, so, you know, all of you represent these cohorts and groups but we need to strategically leverage each other. And oops, 
So I represent Latinas in Tech for about 27,000 members across the globe in the US. Um, have colleagues here also representing the Guerilla and SHIP, who are also part of the you know, Latinos in Tech kind of uh, group. And so we do all this amazing work and it's wonderful, but we still see that there's so much we need to achieve and accomplish. And I'm wondering, you know, what are we not doing correctly? Because we're putting so much work and how can we be more efficient moving into the future? Again, leveraging each other strengths to really not be so siloed and you know like you've mentioned create that pipeline i think a lot of awards like should have wonderful pipeline development latinas in tech not as much uh, and probably many of you do so let's come after this to do something at a higher level where we can have a greater impact much much faster much much faster I agree with you. It's easy, it's easier said than done. Uh, Go ahead, David. I might say like I infiltrate both like stuff and they change things. And changing Burning Man from like zero percent Latino and Black people to whatever the fuck it is today, which I think was seven percent last year, took me uh, many years. No, no, no. But that took me like nothing. In tech, I've been you know banging at it for twelve years, and what have we done? Well, no, people are in tech idea. No, no, exactly. Like we found things, but but I'm saying the rate of change can be much faster. Right. The rate of change can be well, yeah. that's the goal, right? To work together to change the rate. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And what I would offer is that I don't think we're doing anything wrong. I think we really are trying to figure it out live time. And I think mm -hmm. we're also up again, and not to like say that you know, it's just think we're really up against a lot of systems and a lot of systems that are in place separate from the people within them. I think that's what systemic people don't like realize what systemic means. It's like separate from the people that are in there. It's going to happen. Something it's like that. But yeah, it's complicated. No, no, we so, overcomplicate it. Like in Colombia, we say like, la suave, and that's all there is to say here. We need like 200 pounds. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But um, so thank you for that. I just want to keep us on time and we do have to wrap up, but I wanted to give us as much time as possible to talk. Thank you so, so, so much, each of you, for coming in your time. This obviously doesn't happen in a silo, and I'm so grateful that I got to talk with all of you all. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to see what happens and what partnerships happen. So we started late. We have a little bit of time. Maybe some networking can happen, and um, we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Yay, yay, so, yay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yes